responsibility yet again uh, with respect to the missing and murdered Indigenous women, uh, American Indians, and Alaska Natives. We look very forward um, to hearing your input that we will hear today on the call. And I just thank you for allowing me a couple minutes of your time to reaffirm the President's commitment, our commitment, and to thank each and every one of you for what you're doing every day to ease suffering, to increase opportunity, and to save lives. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Kellyanne. This is Doug Holscher uh, from the White House Intergovernmental Affairs Team. Uh, Kellyanne hit on several things. I'm going to talk about some of the accomplishments in a little bit when we get to the slide deck. I just I was honored to join the President at the roundtable in Arizona with uh, leaders of the Navajo Nation and also the Gila River Indian community, uh, where once again the President highlighted this very important issue set. Uh, as I've shared with some of you before, I was very moved uh, by the listening sessions that I participated in in, in Alaska last summer and uh, really uh, uh, humbled to be a part of this effort and to help make progress on this, as Kellyanne put it, long forgotten, long overlooked issue set. So I'll get to a few more comments a little bit later. I'll turn it over to Jenny Lichter. Thanks, Doug. Hi, everyone. This is Jenny Lichter, Deputy Director of the Domestic Policy Council in, here in the White House. On behalf of, of my team, BPC, I'm really grateful to all of you for joining us today. I'm grateful for the gift of your time at a time Your that conference is being platform. recorded. And uh, grateful to all of you for trusting us with your stories and your, your suggestions. We are totally committed, as Kellyanne and Doug have mentioned, to working with you to bring justice to your loved ones and to your communities. And I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you today about how we can work with you more effectively to do that. Thank you again. And Petty Wash Day Madakiapi, Chan Te Wash Day Nape Chu Zaki, Jini Hablana Machiapi, Isantiriate Matahan, Commissioner to Administration for Native Americans, Ed Wawashi Chamu. Good afternoon, my relatives. I greet you with a good heart. My name is Jeannie Hublin. I'm a proud member of the Flandre Santi Sioux Tribe, and I'm Commissioner of the Administration for Native Americans, which is under the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, I want to thank all of those on the line from the White House and our federal agencies and on the task force for the work that has been committed to as we address this uh, issue of the missing and murdered relatives of ours across our uh, tribal nations and in our urban settings. And thank the tribal leadership and the family members that have been advocating for uh, this to be addressed. Uh, your voices have been heard. I'm grateful the President has uh, established a task force and an executive order recognizing this important issue and making it a priority of this administration. Um, I look forward to uh, looking at this uh, with our tribal leadership and communities through the lens of health and human services so that we can partner and find ways to prevent uh, more of our relatives from going missing or being murdered, and also provide healing and intervention services for victims and families and communities as we recover from this. So look forward to hearing from you today, and thank you for letting me be part of this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Difficulties, but we will get through them. Uh, are you able to hear me? Okay. Uh, so as I was saying, we appreciate the interest of tribal leaders and others joining in this call and that the information shared here today is very important. Uh, in honor of our government-to-government -government relationship, when it comes time for questions, we respectfully request that questions come from tribal leaders only for the first 30 minutes. Uh, the time remaining will then be uh, open for comments from uh, tribal communities, stakeholders, and advocates. 
Uh, we ask that you keep your comments to approximately three minutes today, given the number of participants. Uh, the task force will schedule additional listening sessions, consultations, and you will have the ability to provide written testimony. Just a couple of uh, routine housekeeping items. Uh, if you wish to speak, please use the raise your hand button located in the drop down at the top of your screen. It's either indicated by a hand icon or a figure with an arm raised. Uh, your microphone will be unmuted when it is your turn. You can only speak if you've dialed in. Uh, when you are up to speak, please identify yourself with your name, spelling, title, and the tribe or organization that you represent. Uh, there is a three-minute timer located at the bottom of the screen to ensure that we are able to speak to as many people as possible. And this has been a request that has been received by Indian Affairs to ensure that uh, folks are timed and uh, that we allow ample opportunity for those waiting in the queue to provide comments. So um, meaning absolutely no disrespect, but at the end of your three minutes, your line will be muted. And moving on to uh, the next uh, speaker. For everyone's awareness, everything that is said during this telephonic consultation will be recorded and become part of the final transcript. Uh, if you wish to provide uh, a written comment during this presentation, please use the comment box that is available. We have individuals monitoring uh, the, 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 the comments that are coming in, and they will provide uh, some additional information there. If you wish to submit more detailed written comments, you have that opportunity. You can submit them directly to uh, Operation Lady Justice at usdoj.gov. Uh, in, in terms of uh, moving along with this listening session, we're going to provide a brief overview of uh, the task force. And each task force member will uh, have the opportunity to introduce themselves. And we've, we've heard from Commissioner Hovland. Uh, and uh, then we will do a brief overview of the, the work that the task force has been performing uh, and uh, providing some probing questions for the audience to consider uh, as we continue with this listening session. And so with that, uh, I will start the PowerPoint presentation and turn it back over to Doug Holscher uh, with the White House Intergovernmental Affairs. All right, thank you very much, Assistant Secretary Sweeney. Uh, I think my line is unmuted now. I, I want to just uh, add a little context to um, uh, the overall efforts of the Trump administration. Obviously, we're all on this call today because we care about the issue of missing and murdered Native Americans. And um, President Trump was the first president to formally address the issue of missing murdered Native Americans, first in a proclamation a, a, a little over a year ago. Um, uh, he signed a second proclamation uh, uh, last, uh, earlier this month when he was in Arizona at the round table with uh, Native American leaders. Um, and as Kellyanne mentioned, signed an executive order that created this very important task force and the work that we're all a part of, including most importantly uh, the folks who live in Indian country and have had personal or professional experience in this issue set. The president also uh, has formed a presidential task force on protecting Native American children in the Indian Health Service. And so uh, we look forward to uh, having those recommendations uh, rolled out in the very near future. The President also uh, asked his administration to update long thought Eagle Remains policy um, that had been sought by tribal leaders for, for many years. And so Denny Lichter, who you heard from earlier today, was a, a real leader on advancing that important work. Um, the Trump administration has also worked to repatriate culturally important remains and artifacts and, uh, uh, from the Mesa Verde region and uh, working uh, with counterparts around the world on that effort. And so that was something that the president announced uh, uh, in the White House uh, last fall. And so we continue that important work. 
We also, as Kellyanne mentioned, uh, the Trump administration is the first administration to ho ever host a federal tribal broadband summit. Also the first administration to uh, host a White House conference on supporting Native American veterans. And I think most of the people on this call appreciate that uh, Native American uh, participate in our armed forces at a higher rate than the average population. So uh, really a tribute to uh, that, that uh, culture of service, uh, but also the commitment that the President has to our nation's veterans. And then finally, and, and most recently, uh, the administration led by Tyler Fish and, and many federal leaders from the CDC and uh, Jeannie Hubland and Admiral Wiaki and many others have been uh, really laser focused on supporting uh, tribal and Native American community leaders in, in the COVID-19 effort. And so if you have any questions offline, we, we host a weekly uh, a call with tribal and Native American leaders each Thursday. Tyler Fish is a great contact for that if you uh, are not involved and want to get involved in those conversations. And I just wanted to, to, to again, uh, share some perspective on our overall efforts on uh, uh, helping support Indian country and our, our, our tribal leaders across the, the nation. And uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to present that and look forward to hearing your input moving forward. Thank you. Uh, he will be joining other listening sessions, but uh, he had a commitment that he could not uh, break for, for this listening session today. Uh, as you know, uh, on November 26, 2019, President Trump signed Executive Order 13898, and the, the graphic there uh, illustrates uh, his signature on the executive order that formed the task force on missing and murdered American Indians and Alaska Natives, also known as Operation Lady Justice. Uh, the purpose, as you can see on the screen, is uh, to make the criminal justice system work better. Uh, and again, you've heard from the DPC, Intergovernmental Affairs, and Ms. Conway, the commitment from the administration to ensure that this task force remains on task, uh, delivering to uh, the requirements in the executive order. Uh, co the task force co-chair designees, uh, the Attorney General and the Secretary of the Interior are the co-chairs for uh, the, the, the task force and I am Secretary Bernhardt's uh, designee and Catherine Katie Sullivan with the Department of Justice is uh, Attorney General Barr's uh, designee, Katie. Oh, you're you're off mute. If I could follow up with Katie. Katie. Yes. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Oh, great. Okay. Um, I am the principal deputy assistant attorney general of justice programs. Uh, it's a great honor to serve as co-chair with Sweeney, Assistant Secretary Sweeney, uh, on the President's Task Force. I have to say that General Barr, one of the, his priority areas is absolutely ensuring that there is public safety in, uh, in Indian country uh, for both Alaska Natives and our Native American partners. He takes this trust responsibility, this government-to-government -government trust responsibility very seriously, and uh, this is without a question something that he, along with President Trump, uh, highlights as a, as a crucial area of concern, and that is the missing and murdered indigenous people in Indian country. So we've been working very hard um, uh, during the shutdown on getting some of our tasks completed, uh, which Tara is going to talk about more in the PowerPoint. Um, but Attorney General Barr does send his regards, and uh, we we join this 
the Department of Interior with equal enthusiasm and commitment as described by the White House. Uh, and thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to listening. Thank you. Hear from Terry Wade. At this time, we will hear from Terry Wade. Thank you. Okay, uh, it, Mr. Wade is the Executive Assistant Director for Criminal Cyber Response and Services Branch at the Federal Bureau of in Investigation uh, with the Department of Justice. And I, again, I believe we're having some technical difficulties, uh, but we will continue on. Uh, Laura Rogers. Laura Rogers? Laura, Laura Rogers is not on the line right now. She must have gotten disconnected. She was on earlier. My apologies for those who are listening. Laura Rogers is the Acting Director, Office on Violence Against Women with the Department of Justice. We also have uh, Charlie Addington. I can see that he's a participant. So, so many of you in Indian Country know uh, Charlie Addington. He's the Deputy Bureau Director uh, for the Bureau of Indian Affairs Office of Justice Services here at uh, DOI. And uh, do we have audio access for Trent Shores? I do have audio access for Trent Shores. I, Charlie Addington was not on the line. He Trent was. Shores I, used to be I okay. I see Trent so Shores. Trent is Shores. Carlito, uh, this is Trent Shores, the United States Attorney in the Northern District of Oklahoma. I am also honored to uh, listen today as a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, and also as the chair of Attorney General Barr's Native American Issues Subcommittee. Uh, I look forward to hearing what it is that. Uh, you have to say today and certainly can assure you that uh, this listening session is, is only a step toward action and we know that action is what is needed on this issue. Uh, Yokoke and I look forward to your comments. Thank you Trent uh, and of course uh, Commissioner Hovland if you have any uh, final words. Again, thank you for the opportunity to be here, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions that I can uh, in regards to the programs and services at the Department of Health and Human Services that will assist in uh, prevention and education and um, recovery and healing for our community. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, these next few slides you will see uh, talks, they illustrate the accomplishments of the task force. You can see that we've held uh, five previous listening sessions. This is the sixth, uh, and we will continue to host more in the coming weeks. As part of the work that the, the task force has, has done, uh, certainly many of you know Marsha Good for her work at the uh, Department of Justice, uh, bringing her on as the executive director and uh, making live the OperationLadyJustice.USDOJ.gov website. And there, that website is, is designed to inform all of you. 
uh, on the activities that, that the task force will be engaged with, the, any sort of frequently asked questions that we receive, fact sheets. Uh, it is designed to be an information portal uh, to provide uh, updates and um, transcripts from these types of listening sessions so that uh, for those who cannot attend, uh, either through WebEx or through a teleconference or maybe in the future in person, the information is, is available online for those to review. Uh, and it is accessible so that uh, for those who choose to engage through written comments will have the um, benefit of what others across the country are sharing with respect to this issue. And uh, we have the, the formed work groups. Uh, even though we have been maximizing our uh, telework flexibilities within the federal government, the work still continues. And so uh, these bullets here on this slide illustrate uh, the, the, the continued work that the task force and the uh, relevant work groups are um, engaged with. Again, this slide talks about uh, the specific projects. And there's one that you know, I uh, would like to highlight on the page. And it's the first bullet of the restarting the volunteers in police service program to help utilize community volunteers in missing persons uh, cases. And that's extremely important. As we all know, it, it takes the community. And it's important for uh, those who have information they have access to uh, the infrastructure necessary to effectuate any sort of change or development in a missing person's case. You'll see on this slide, uh, it highlights the different uh, organizations with which the task force has engaged uh, over, over since, since February. Uh, looking at the, um, the President's Commission on Law Enforcement, the Alice Spotted Bear and Walter Sobolev Commission on Native Children, uh, and other equities on the, on the slide. This slide highlights the, uh, the interaction that the task force and its members have had uh, across our um, federal family. Now you'll see there are two dates on here that are very important. By November 26th of this year, 2020, we are required to submit a report to the president. Uh, and we, in that report, it is uh, to highlight the activities and the accomplishments, but also any sort of recommendations that we may have at this juncture. And then again, in November 26th, 2021, we are required to submit uh, a final report to the president. And I know there have been times where folks have asked about uh, the participation of tribal leadership on the task force. Uh, the way the executive order uh, spells out this task force, we are an all federal task force with specific tasks to accomplish to present to the president, which is why we set out to have a very robust schedule uh, with respect to listening sessions and consultations throughout Indian country. And so uh, while we may have um, hit the pause button as we all responded and to the, the COVID pandemic and engaged in mitigation efforts, uh, we are now resuming these listening sessions and engagement across Indian country, which is so important because these listening sessions will inform the decisions and recommendations that we put forward to the president. And so, uh, operator, I would like to open up the lines uh, for uh, the listening session. On screen here, you will find uh, questions that have been raised by uh, the task force in our discussions. Uh, they're, they're meant to be guiding questions, 
Uh, but at this time, uh, we would like to hear from tribal leaders for the first 30 minutes. Uh, for those who are interested in participating, uh, and then we will open it up beyond that for the remainder of the time. And each speaker will have three minutes uh, to, to present. We will also, um, I just want, if, if there are specific questions for task force members or a specific uh, department or agency inside of DOJ or DOI or HHS as it relates to Operation Lady Justice, uh, please uh, let us know uh, so that we can have the appropriate task force member provide uh, an answer. Thank you. Operator, um, open up. Up. you may go ahead and speak. If you would like to ask any questions or make comments, just raise your hand. We have nobody raising their hand at this moment. Okay, Lynn, you may go ahead. Chairwoman Malerba. Yes, Lynn, um, if you're there, you may go ahead and speak. Operator, are the lines unmuted? The lines are actually all unmuted at this moment, and I'm not able to get anyone to speak. So for those who uh, are joining the WebEx uh, and have not uh, provided a phone number to call in, uh, you may want to uh, connect to the WebEx through the, the app. Operator, can you, provide, uh, can you provide instructions on what they need to do? Um, yes, if they would, uh, they could, Hello? I don't know what would be the, yes. Hello? Hello. Who's speaking? My name is Renee Malarchuk. Yes, can you hear me? Are we allowed to speak now or? Yes. I have a quick question. Has every um, effort been afforded to bridge the digital divide for Indian country right now? Because a lot of people are being impacted. It's really hard to make these sessions in order to speak on a very critical issue. I know a lot of people would like to speak on. Hello? 
Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, regarding the digital divide, it is a priority for the administration to address those types of issues. Uh, currently, this is the technology that we have to conduct these sessions. Uh, to be able to have the, um, the ability to, to call in, but also to have uh, the WebEx presentation. OK. Um, I would like to speak from the organization that I come from in Denver, Colorado, which deals with the unique um, issues of both urban and rural native connections and how that impacts for MMIW is also very unique and has and follows oftentimes with extractive industries. So I'd like to be able to speak on that from Spirit of the Sun at Four Winds American Indian Council in Denver. Okay, you have um, three minutes. Okay. Awesome. I am um, should I go ahead and start now? Yep, your time is ticking. I am Renee Malar Chacon, a writer, director, and a Seca Pansante Chicana activist, and most importantly, a mother of two sons. I am an indigenous woman of the Neymashica descent, fighting for future generations, and committed to relating climate justice to social justice. My family is from the Denver community, and I now work as youth program coordinator at Spirit of the Sun in Denver, addressing where communities have been targeted, target, targeted and isolated with pollution and corruption is critical in addressing this crisis and the climate crisis. Issues of environmental racism and exploitation of resources leaves land and MMIW not the latest, but the first example of human victims to exploited as effects of overconsumption and environmental resources spilling over to social injustice of marginalized and impoverished communities, not able to legally protect themselves from it. The root of this is predatory capitalism, where people deeply impoverished will be the first to be hit with toxicity both material and socioeconomic resources, and social exploitation and trafficking. We need to recognize that the contributing factors to MMIW, girls and people, men and people, is a social injustice worldwide. It's predatory capitalism, is modern colonialism. It preys on those easiest to be harmed without any protection to those communities. When local, rural, and sovereign communities have to provide for themselves socioeconomically, people are put in a position to have to seek outside of their community's protection and awareness without resources that hold predators accountable legally or in economic, federal or state policies, exploitation. The harm to these local members always happens when it's predatory and it has been going unnoticed and invis invisible. At the root of this is a radical exploitation of poverty and lack of representation, including the lack of access to the most basic human rights, legal protections, and access to affluence to build their own socioeconomic stability and renewable infrastructure. We want support from all police departments and the FBI, from the court to the prosecutors to coroners. We need allies. We need non-natives. Who need, we need whoever wants to join and speak with us against this injustice. It has been a long legacy of suffering that has led to dramatic inequity, inequality, and no enforcement or accountability to protect children, women, men, and the earth being destroyed from outdated, wasteful industries not committed to renewable, sustainable, and inclusive progress for future generations. Thank you. Thank Operator, you. are you able... Operator, are you able to uh, connect uh, Chief Malerba? Operator? I'm going Erica? to manually, yes, I'm, I'm here. I'm going to manually en enter her to the call. I'm doing that right now. We called Hi. Lynn. Hi, it's 
Chief Malerba, thank you for calling me. I don't know what was going on with my computer, so I appreciate you doing that. Um, so I'm the chief of the Mohegan Tribe, and I'm also the secretary for the United South and Eastern Tribe Sovereignty Protection Fund. And I'm very appreciative of the, of the work that's happening. And I have a couple of questions, and I'll ask them all at once, since I know I only have three minutes to speak. Um, one is, I understand that there are no tribal leaders on the task force, and, and I'm wondering how you will incorporate um, tribal leaders' feedback and how um, will Indian country be briefed on what your reports will be? And will we have an opportunity to provide feedback once um, you have recommendations that are going to be going to the president? Uh, because I think it's going to be really important to have that feedback loop. And I'm hoping that as we think about some of the programs that we will be able to share that we think about um, how we can increase the special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction to all tribes, um, and that any programming or any new programming and funding that occurs uh, will be uh, through self-governance and will not be through grants, because as you all know, grants do not uphold the trust and treaty obligations. Um, so I'll leave it at that, but I don't think that just the final recommendations you know, should be the end of it. There should be a continuing dialogue with tribal leaders and tribal nations so that we all get to the point of really serving our tribal communities. So thank you for that. Thank you for uh, your input and, and feedback. I want to give um, Katie Sullivan an opportunity to answer some of the questions that you have raised at this time. Katie is on. Hi, am I cutting out again? You're good. Oh, I am good. Okay. And can we just can you repeat the question to me, please? Well, there were there were um, several. Uh, most notably, you know, uh, Chief Malerba had raised the issue of no. Uh, tribal leaders on the task force and whether or not uh, there would be a ample time for feedback loop mechanism uh, based on our uh, draft report to the president. Oh, yeah. If tribes would have an opportunity to engage, uh, engage with the uh, draft report, provide feedback to have that further incorporated into uh, the recommendations and what we report back to the president. Yeah, so a, a couple things. Thank you, Tara. Um, and I just wanted to be clear with what we, so those, the logistical issues that surround the task force have obviously adjusted a little bit because of COVID-19 and our inability to travel into Indian country. I really appreciate the question about whether or not we are able to make sure that Indian country and particularly very rural communities have access to the kind of um, technology that you need to participate in these sessions. So I want to start by saying, and I think the task force will agree, that having these sessions is just a way for us to get things started again, that we do plan on traveling to Indian country when you all feel safe for us to come and we can travel as well. So having the government-to-government -government conversations and sessions is vital to the success of the task force's work. Now, we have created and are starting to create in the middle of creating some ideas and some drafts, but a huge part of this is getting input from all of you um, to you know, finalize anything that we do. The other thing is, and I will say I've heard the Attorney General say it many times, um, you know, we oftentimes the federal government comes up with rules that apply to all people. It happens in grant making in particular, where you say this one grant, this one program is going to serve everyone's needs. And of course, we know that that isn't true. So one of the things that the Attorney General, and I know, you know Tara Sweeney and I have discussed as well, um, 
we want to do is make sure that whatever, say, procedures or protocols that are put in place, that's one of the pillars of what needs to come out of this um, executive order of the president, is that it can be implemented in any, in Indian country, anywhere, that we want it to be flexible to meet your needs. And we understand that not all needs are the same and that every single tribe does have different needs. So we will continue getting input without any question. Um, we do have a report due to the president uh, November 2020. We will receive as much input as we possibly can. But, you know, I think it's fair to say that nothing is set in stone until, um, until we have done all the consultation and listening sessions that we have promised to do. COVID put a wrench in the timing a little bit, but it's a postponement. It's not canceled. Um, the only other thing I want to say about the broadband is I know that it is a, a priority of the White House to make sure that there is access to broadband, particularly in rural communities, and there really are some very creative, innovative ideas on how we are going to be able to expand access as an administration. And I know that that will have a very positive effect on Indian country. It's not a focus of this task force, but it does go back to that original question that was asked. So thank you. Uh, Katie, I appreciate the, the touchback to, to broadband. One thing that I would like to address is um, there are uh, initiatives taking place, I know, within the Department of the Interior to take a look at the, uh, the broadband uh, infrastructure capacity in Indian country, uh, especially as it relates to the schools and uh, online learning. Uh, we are looking at an innovative project and looking at the 25 longest bus routes in Indian country uh, to equip them with the necessary infrastructure to provide connectivity for students who can uh, complete their homework along these uh, extremely long uh, bus routes. Uh, in addition to that, uh, working with uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, to take a look at what infrastructure is needed uh, in, to, to, to increase connectivity capacity in Indian country. Uh, with that, operator, are there any other tribal leaders who have questions? Um, no, there are like no, there's no one else with their hand raised at this moment. Okay. Um, I want to go back to Chief uh, Malerba. You also had asked a, a question pertaining to Oliphant. And I see that in the comments there is also a question that was raised uh, about uh, the U.S. Supreme Court decision, Oliphant versus the Suquamish tribe. And I just want to, to provide an answer there that um, Marsha has shared in that, uh, that that issue is currently beyond the scope of the task force work at, at this time. Are there any other tribal leaders who wish to speak? Operator, we're happy to open the lines uh, up to uh, community advocates and other stakeholders. Can you remind okay. folks how to uh, how to um, let you know that they would like to get in the queue? Yes, to indicate that you would like to speak, if you go to the top portion of your browser or the application, you'll see either a hand icon or a figure with the hand raised. And you push that drop down and raise your hand, and you will be entered into the queue uh, to be called on to ask questions. Okay, next speaker. 
Um, we have Iona. Operator, next speaker. Yeah. Do we have Iona? Okay, and um, after Iona, we have Kitty. Good afternoon. This is Kitty with USET Sovereignty Protection Fund. Can you hear me? Sure can. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for holding today's call. I just wanted to follow up to the conversation that we just had a moment ago about the report that's going to the president uh, in November of this year. Uh, first, a comment and a request for inclusion, but also a suggestion as well. So I think we all are too well familiar with the challenges and the jurisdictional complications that have resulted in uh, the consequences that lead to this MMIW issue and a multitude of other reasons as well. And tied to that is the issue of a lack of resources because of some of those decisions that have been made over the years to adequately deal with this issue uh, across Indian country, including one of the things that's fresh right now in front of us, which is the reauthorization of uh, the VAWA Act. Um, so I think it's going to be extremely important for the report that goes to the president to deal with the systemic issues that are driving these consequential issues uh, on this matter and to really do a deep dive and do a deep examination um, and close look about all of those things that led to these jurisdictional, jurisdictional complications. Um, but in terms of a suggestion, uh, one of the seats that I occupy in my role uh, is I am a representative for the Eastern Region on the Tribal Interior Budget Committee. And I know within the interior space there is um, OJS, uh, in addition to the work of Department of Justice, and one of the things that is very important uh, within this entire space is to know what we are dealing with from a very fact-based perspective. And one of the challenges that we have within this area, as well as other areas across Indian country, is just a failure of adequate information to drive some of the decisions that we are making. So I know that there is sometimes overlap and sometimes there is not between those two respective areas, uh, but oftentimes we're having conversations that are separate from each other within those two spaces. And one of the things that we would like to see um, as this effort moves forward is for the administration to make a commitment to identify what the real data is here, including the shortfalls as relates to resources. So because of some of those jurisdictional determinations and decisions that were made in previous years that led to the current situation, uh, we rely on federal resources to um, do a lot of the enforcement. And that enforcement in many times uh, is inadequate. Uh, as well as, as Chief Mulerba was talking about, is regaining um, the inherent authorities that are ours through full criminal jurisdiction authority. So we would ask that as part of the solution in the report that goes forward is for a commitment by the administration and working with DOJ as well as OJS to do a deep dive into the data as, as well as the resources that are necessary uh, based upon the way that it is structured right now to improve uh, the enforcement part of it. And short and long-term objective is to achieve full jurisdictional restoration for all tribal nations. Thank you. Thank you. Operator, next uh, speaker. Um, I still just have Iona. Is Iona on the line? Hello? Um, that's all I have right now. Is there any anyone else from the Eastern Region who'd like to provide comments? Um. Hello? Operator, I hear someone saying hello faintly. Hello? Yes, I can barely hear them. Who is this? This is Iona. 
There you are. I have my oh, volume up loud. Can can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, my my thank you. Um, my question was concerning um, how other tribes are actually being reached out. Like, what is the mechanism that you are doing to reach all of the different tribes? And since we're talking about the Eastern region, I was specifically asking, too, about the Shinnecock Indian Nation, the Algonquin tribe in southeastern New York. I put a comment also of my question in to see if maybe Marsha could um, or someone could answer it that way. Uh, thank you for your question. I heard a little bit of it. Uh, it seems like there's some background noise, but I can I can answer a portion of it, and I welcome the opportunity for other task members to uh, provide their input. Uh, but what we're doing is providing uh, listening sessions uh, to various regions across the United States. Uh, and, and I know that you were talking about Shinnecock, which they are included in the eastern region. Uh, and so, pardon? Uh, in addition to that, there will be a listening session provided uh, to the um, eastern Oklahoma and southern plains. Uh, as well as the Midwest and Rocky Mountain uh, Western region, in addition to the Pacific, uh, the, the Northwest, and Alaska regions as well. So those round out the, the four scheduled listening sessions. Uh, we, will, we are scheduled to have a consultation on July 7 in Billings and an additional one, again, in Alaska. Uh, prior to these listening sessions, we held six previous ones. And preceding the, uh, preceding the, uh, the signing of the executive order, uh, there were a series of Reclaiming Our uh, Native Community roundtables held across the country. Uh, in addition to the work that was that has been done by the U.S. Attorney's Office, and so uh, Trent or um, Laura or uh, Katie, if you have additional information, and Charlie as well, um, please feel free to to share that. Okay. Operator, are there other any other questions? Uh, no, I just, there's no one else with their hand raised at this moment. Operator? Yes, there's still uh, no one with their hand raised. Oh, I just got one. Um, it's uh, Momo Har Harjo. I did not say that name right. I apologize. But uh, your microphone is on, and you can speak. Hello? Yes, 
Okay. Those, that's the only person that has their hand raised at this moment. Are there any other participants who would like to uh, speak at this time or provide input into this listening session? No, they dodge questions. Pardon? Um, uh, it's Lady Jessica. Operator, if people have only dialed in telephonically because there were some tech issues on the web page, they won't be able to raise their hand. Could you provide mm -hmm. instructions for those only who, who have called in by telephone only how to get in the queue for you? Um, they, they would have to uh, email, I guess. I'm not sure how else. Um, we don't have any way to indicate otherwise. Thank you. Um, we have an Elizabeth Carr. Elizabeth. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, great, thank you. This is Elizabeth Carr, and I am the Senior Native Affairs Advisor for the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center, and I, um, I just wanted to reiterate a question that was asked in the comment section regarding the status of the Indian Country Crimes Unit at the FBI um, and what their engagement level is with the task force and, and what their work looks like. Thank you. Uh, do we have uh, either Terry Wade or Mr. Cullen on the phone to provide an answer? So this is Marcia Good, who's the executive director of the task force. I can speak to that a little bit if you'd like me to. And I know that Tim Dunham, who is also with the FBI, is also on the phone. Um, and he could also answer that question. Tim, are you available to answer? Can I be heard? I'm, I'm here, yes. Yes, that would be great. Thank you, Tim. Hi, so great. I'm sorry I missed the introductions earlier. My name is Tim Dunham. I'm the Deputy Assistant Director here at the FBI's Criminal Investigative Division. Uh, and in my branch is where our Indian Country Investigative Programs uh, Unit is housed. And we work the full range of investigative programs on Indian countries. I'm sure most of the participants here know. Um, we're going to be fully engaged with the task force and its work uh, going forward. We'll be represented on all of these calls and uh, seek to answer whatever needs of the community that we can uh, during these times of conversation. And this is Marcia. As the executive director, I just wanted to chime in a little bit that the um, Indian Country and Violent Crime Unit has been involved in basically every project that we're working on through our working groups in the task force including development of the protocols and working on the data issues. And so they are, not only the unit, but others from the FBI are also very involved. Great, thank you. And I have one more question, if that's okay. 
Sure. So I know that a lot of the, um, there are a lot of barriers that are created um, from, from federal policy um, that's legislatively mandated um, and dictated by Supreme Court cases. But I'm wondering if um, there's any decision or administrative decision that can be made um, to ensure that the FBI and, and the BIA um, don't uh, overutilize discretion and when, when they're deciding whether or not to investigate a crime against a Native woman. Um, we believe that if a Native woman is a citizen of a federally recognized tribe and lives on tribal lands, um, that if and when she goes missing, um, the FBI should be required to investigate it. Um, and so we're wondering if there's any waiver of discretion on, um, on that aspect of, of investigation from an administrative um, decision standpoint. DOJ? Well, I mean, I, this is Katie, and I think I can impart answer the question, but um, then I'm going to defer to Trent. Um, you know, it's important to, and I think when we're looking at protocols and procedures, right, we have to be very careful to look at the two types of cases that we're talking about, missing cases, and then there's cases in which people are murdered, and there's also cases in which there's domestic violence, sexual assault, et cetera, et cetera. We want to make sure that all of those responses are, you know, completely robust and work for each individual community, each individual tribal community. Um, not every missing case necessarily is a criminal case, and that's where it can get tricky, but where it is, then obviously we want to be jumping in and doing the best that we can. But I'm going to defer, defer to Trent, who is in the field as a prosecutor. Well, good afternoon. I, I really think that this is a great question uh, because it's one that I hear a lot. And I know that United States attorneys and tribal liaisons in U.S. attorney's offices hear a lot. And Katie's really hit the nail on the head when it comes to first distinguishing between murdered victims and persons who are missing. The FBI, for example, is going to come in and investigate when a crime has occurred. And one of the questions I think that we really have to look at here is at what point is, is it appropriate or should the Federal Bureau of Investigation become involved in a missing person case? Traditionally, and typically, that's a local law enforcement function. So in Indian country, it's a tribal law enforcement function. If that community is served by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Office of Justice Services, then uh, they would be the officers who would, who would receive the initial uh, report and then uh, begin the investigation, or rather at that point, a search for the missing person. I will say, as part of the Department of Justice's efforts that really go hand in glove with the uh, White House task force here, uh, the FBI did expand its use of what we call PARD, C-A-R-D. That's the Child Abduction Rapid Deployment Team. Uh, in fact, we just used one here recently in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I am. When there was a report of a missing child, the FBI is able to come in and use these teams to help assist in, in the search. We've seen it in the context of missing uh, of a missing indigenous person, uh, missing Native American in Montana. And so I think that as we begin to look at the development of investigative protocols, one of those factors has to be at what point does the FBI and BIA engage in the search for a missing person? I think it's a really important question, and I think that's something that uh, not just the FBI, but this task force has to look at together to figure out what is the proper protocol to make sure that that happens early and to make sure that the response is comprehensive and that it's coordinated. And that means that the search is, uh, the pro progress of the search is communicated with the victims, uh, family through victim coordinators, that uh, the tribal community is made aware of the efforts that are ongoing and that we continue to ensure that this isn't something that, for whatever reason, falls off the radar. This is important. It is a crisis. And I think that 
that kind of coordinated response with search teams early on uh, will be helpful. So uh, thank you for that question. I, I think it, it's a really important one. Thank you. Operator, uh, next speaker. Um, we have Momo should be receiving and connecting to the line. Next speaker. Um, we were un we were unable to connect with uh, Mo. Um, that uh, he was the that is the last person that we had with their hand raised. Okay. Um, at this time, I would also like to call on Charlie Addington uh, to provide an update on uh, the cold case working group. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Can, can you all hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is Charlie Addington, the director for the BI Office of Justice Services. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we're looking uh, at moving forward with is the, you know, the cold case investigative teams uh, that will enhance our uh, response to uh, the missing persons and uh, the issue of investigating uh, cold cases throughout the Indian country. And we have established uh, uh, seven proposed locations uh, for those investigative teams, and we have uh, recruited for uh, new special agents to actually fill positions in those locations. And we've got two that's, uh, that's in the process of reporting um, here the end of this month, and then one more that's coming on in July and then the others that's going through uh, our uh, human resources process. These task forces will also be uh, comprehensive and, and actually um, a multidisciplinary uh, approach to where we'll be working hand-in-hand uh, -hand with our other federal partners at the Department of Justice, the FBI, uh, our local uh, tribal law enforcement agencies uh, in these areas as well as any uh, state or local law enforcement agencies where they may have uh, information or something may lead us into uh, um, leads or something you know off off of Indian country as well and also working with our uh, local um, groups uh, locally our grassroots folks with missing and murdered groups uh, actually uh, working with the schools with the health care officials all the different uh, programs that we would need to be successful. And we've got those in the works right now. We're, we're very excited uh, with the work that's going on. We've began collecting uh, cold case cases uh, throughout Indian country, uh, and we are working very closely with the Department of Justice. And, and I can't say enough about the excitement that we've got uh, with our partnership uh, with everybody as we move forward on these. And, and uh, we look forward in the next few months of standing uh, a couple of these up and getting them started. And uh, hopefully we will be uh, getting some cases going fairly soon. Okay, thank you, uh, Director Addington. Are there any other uh, questions in the queue? So we have, um, I know that uh, I guess Momo Harjo was uh, trying to connect and the question uh, Momo posed was related to the challenges in how the agencies coordinate in missing persons cases. Uh, the matter of a missing person can present a multi-jurisdictional problem. It may not be clear where or how a person went missing. So multiple law enforcement agencies may be involved. 
Um, however, cooperation may not be optimal, particularly when there's a scarcity of resources, differences in laws and procedures. Uh, and the, the Ashland Mike case highlighted some of those problems. How can OLJ and the agencies work with state and local jurisdictions to incentivize or guide them to work with tribal or BIA law enforcement agencies on these cases or reports? And Momo, that's a, a great question. Uh, as a task force, when you look at the executive order, uh, there are uh, specific deliverables that require this improved interagency cooperation uh, and also uh, working with our local partners um, to address these types of issues. And I see that Olivia Gray has asked a question as well uh, on how we can, we the federal government can work uh, with local counties to uh, investigate these types of, of cases. Uh, I want to call on HHS, uh, Michelle, who is uh, going to, ha will be filling in for Jeannie to, to provide a response on the work that HHS is doing uh, with respect to the communications toolkit and the outreach uh, throughout Indian country. And then uh, would like to also uh, reach out to Marsha Good and Katie, or, I'm sorry, um, Laura Rogers and, and Katie Sullivan. Great, thank you, Assistant <coughs> Secretary Sidney. This is Michelle Sovey, and I work with Commissioner Hovland, um, and I am Executive Director for the Intra-Departmental Council for Native American Affairs at HHS. And we have stood up a, a, a subcommittee specifically to look at how HHS can support uh, Operation Lady Justice Task Force. And as uh, the Assistant Secretary said, um, in particular, identify areas where HHS already works regionally, locally, um, across our different divisions, for example, with the CDC and building up the public health response. Um, we work with a lot of the same first responders um, that Interior and Justice are working with, but we work with them in a different, in a different way. Um, for example, we're, we're working with them to, to build up their um, ability to respond to um, local health emergencies or crises. So as part of this response, um, we are identifying ways that we can um, create more awareness about the resources that exist um, and how we can coordinate and collaborate better. And so um, we are building out a strategic plan to identify all of those different touch points um, where we can provide additional training and education um, and making sure that we are coordinating and collaborating, sharing the resources um, that HHS has, for example, on, on um, public health approaches to violence prevention and ending violence in our communities, um, as well as learning more about the resources that interior and justice have, um, so that way we can all be working on the same page um, and communicating um, and collaborating with communities that are on the front lines. So thank you for the opportunity um, to, to mention those efforts. Uh, anything from DOJ, Laura Rogers? Good afternoon. Can I Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Great. I don't know what happened earlier. Uh, at the Office on Violence Against Women, we are busy pursuing the 904 task force to bring in uh, tribal members to consult with us. And we are going to be pursuing um, additional information and joining with the National Institute of Justice on research with respect to missing and, or murdered indigenous people uh, to investigate uh, ad additional research with respect to the issue uh, and try to identify additional information to um, move that research farther down the line. And so we are excited to reconstitute that task force and begin work uh, later on this summer. 
Thank you. Uh, Katie. Well, I'm just going to um, say that, you know, part of working collaboratively is something, again, that, you know, the Attorney General saw uh, as a need in Indian country. Obviously, President Trump did as well because it's such a big focus of his executive order and of the work of this task force. I know Laura Rogers and I'm sure Jeannie Hovland, everyone, will agree um, that having victim services at the table is very important, as is having good communication between all of the different uh, law enforcement agencies that may be implicated along the way in a case. So to that end, the Attorney General has an initiative of Indian Country. We're employing pro, uh, program coordinators to work to look at how each Indian Country, that they will work through the U.S. Attorney's Office in 11 different jurisdictions and, in essence, look at how are the missing cases um, being handled, how are the murdered cases being handled in order to further inform us so we can inform AUSAs, we can inform the FBI. If we can provide help locally or to tribal law enforcement, of course, we'd love to do that as well. Um, so I think that you know, ensuring that everybody is uh, together and at the table and collaborating and informed, that is the core and essence of this task force and the mission of, the, of President Trump and A.G. Barr and Secretary Bernhardt, Secretary Azar. I mean, this is what we, we really are looking to do in working with all of you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, operator, are there any additional uh, speakers? We have about um, eight minutes there, left. There are not. Okay. Uh, at this time, I would like to provide the task force members to provide any sort of closing comments, starting uh, starting with uh, Michelle, HHS. Yes, thank you so much. And on behalf of Commissioner Hovland, um, we just want to reiterate um, our support and our um, dedication to the goals of the Operation Lady Justice Task Force. Um, we know that how important it is to listen um, to our communities, what is happening on the ground. Um, advocates have been raising this issue, and we are um, up to the challenge to um, identify ways that the federal government can help support um, and address this very important issue. So thank you um, for your continued engagement, and we are looking forward to more listening sessions where we can hear more about how we can support you. Thank you. Thank you. And moving on to the FBI, uh, Timothy Dedham. Uh, I think my soul is boiling. Terry Wade. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of the FBI, I just want to say that we were very pleased to be able to participate in the call today. I look forward to the ongoing engagement and additional communication. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is uh, Trent Shores? Oh, it was on fire. Yes, uh, this is Trent. Uh, I want to thank all the callers today. Uh, in particular, uh, one of the comments that stood out to me was the comment about the need to do a deep dive into some of the statistics and to uh, really get a, a better idea of what it is that we are confronting, the scope of the problem, uh, understanding oh, maybe, uh, where crimes are occurring in Indian country, but also in urban settings, uh, and who the perpetrators are. Uh, I, I think that, that that certainly is something that the task force can take to heart uh, and look at. Uh, the other comment that, that jumped out at me uh, was the one that, that I talked about a little bit, which was that coordination of when the FBI and BIA or, or tribal police engage on a missing persons case. And I've seen there's been some discussion in the comment section as well uh, referencing uh, Oklahoma. So uh, I'm hopeful that uh, callers will engage with their United States Attorney's offices and their tribal liaisons if they have an ongoing issue. Uh, but also I think that those are uh, areas that this task force can really focus on, and I'm thankful to the callers for, for bringing those issue areas up. Those, those are important topics. 
Thank you, Trent. Uh, and moving on to Charlie Addington. Well, thank you. I want to thank everybody that was able to participate in the call today and, and just say, you know, to make it a, a, an effort and make a, a difference out in Indian country, it takes all of us being on the uh, moving in the same direction. I can't say enough uh, about the support that at BI Office of Justice Services that we're getting from the White House, from uh, the cabinet level members, and also from all of our leadership and our partnership with all these other agencies, DOJ, HHS. Uh, this is what it's going to take to move forward and make a difference. And we've already made some changes, you know, locally. I know Trent brought it up a minute ago just about, you know, the response uh, to missing person cases. Uh, we've made changes in the way we respond and the way we coordinate already. We've had some very, uh, very positive uh, uh, situations where we've been on the ground immediately after we receive a missing person uh, complaint, and uh, we coordinate with those other agencies, and it has worked the way it's supposed to work. So as we move forward, we, we just, I think, all the support from everybody uh, from the top to the bottom and getting the community involved is going to be a, just a big asset for us in addressing this crisis. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, Laura Rogers. Tara, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to be on this call, and I want to thank everybody who's taken their time. I know that uh, resources are stretched thin right now with the pandemic, and so thank you so much for your time and your interest. This is a topic that I think is near and dear to everybody's heart, and those of us at OBW are very interested in this topic um, because it deals with women and children and men. Uh, we are very dedicated to this topic. Uh, I would mirror Trent's comments uh, with respect to uh, drilling down on the uh, research and the statistics because I think by identifying the, uh, the accurate uh, research, we'll be able to really uh, narrow down where we need to dedicate our, our resources and uh, work towards a solution. Um, and that's so important to, to really know how we, which direction we need to go in in order to uh, curb the, uh, the insult to women and children and to men. Uh, so I'm very interested in doing that and very interested in working on, on those issues. Um, so uh, thank you so much for your participation and thank you for letting us assist you in this issue. Thank you. And uh, Katie Sullivan. Thank you all so much. This is uh, my favorite part of my job, honestly, is connecting with people in Indian country, figuring out how we can do things better. We clearly have a problem, and I love to find solutions, just like Attorney General Barr. He is a man who likes big problems and then big solutions. And so please expect yeah, please, from us that we are going to make good on our promises. And I also just want to really thank Tara Sweeney and the White House. Um, Tara, you're a wonderful partner in this, and I'm just so glad that we have come together. So thank you, everyone, and Godspeed. Thank you. And then I know that uh, just shortly, uh, there were participants from the White House that were still on. I just want to provide anyone from the White House an opportunity. Okay. Uh, I want to thank all of you for calling in. I also uh, appreciate the patience uh, afforded to us as we try this new technology. As you know, this pandemic has tested so many of our social norms, and uh, this is one of them. So we're, we're trying to find ways to connect with Indian country uh, that, that are safe and um, consistent with the healthy practices that are uh, put out by the CDC. Um, we do have complex problems throughout 
Indian country with respect to public safety. And they do vary by uh, community, which is why, as Katie had said earlier, uh, collaboration is so critical with Indian country. Being an all federal task force uh, and hearing from Indian country the need for constant uh, input by uh, tribal leadership is a message that is not lost on us. And I appreciate Chief Malerba for your um, for you your continuation of beating that drum. Uh, your persistence for, for wanting to share your thoughts today. Uh, I, I, on behalf of the Department of the Interior and Secretary Bernhardt, I look forward to uh, the continued partnership with the Department of Justice and the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, as well as IHS and Tyler Fish at the White House Council for uh, Native American Affairs. Uh, in addition to, and most importantly, the greater tribal uh, community. Uh, we have a large and a very important task ahead of us. And as you know, we're coming together to listen and to learn, uh, to provide recommendations and solutions to address things like data deficiencies, uh, to jumpstart the work on unresolved cases in Indian country and Alaska Native communities, uh, but also to improve, clarify, and communicate the multi-jurisdictional uh, protocols and procedures uh, to across the federal family, but also to those that have to engage with the federal family in times where we find family members missing or murdered, and to, to work across the federal government uh, as directed by President Trump to find agreement on the federal best practices to address this epidemic. Uh, if you would like to submit, again, additional comments, uh, written, written detailed comments, I encourage you to submit those comments to Operation Lady Justice at usdoj.gov. And you can see that email address on your screen uh, through the WebEx. Uh, and I encourage you to visit the website for updates on the progress that the task force is making. And so with that, I wish you all uh, wellness. And thank you so much for your time. And that concludes our listening session.